Hi, thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Exterior Tile Installations, Tiling the Great Outdoors. A little housekeeping before we start. You are on mute. If you have any questions, please enter them in the question and answer panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Also, if you have an AIA number, please enter it and your name and your email address in the question and answer box so that we can send you a certificate for AIA credit. You can also email your name, your AIA number, and your email to mapaydigital at mapay.com. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today's webinar, Mike Granitowski. Mike is the Director of Architectural and Commercial Projects for MAPE. He's a graduate of the University of Arizona, where he studied architecture and graduated with a degree in business administration. Mike has worked in the flooring industry for more than 40 years and has specialized in tile and stone installation systems, where he's been involved with the installation, distribution, and sales with a focus on design professionals. Mike, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jen. I appreciate that. Good morning to everyone. Uh, welcome to this presentation. Looking forward to <clears throat> talking to you about tiling the great outdoors, the interior tile installations. As Jen mentioned, this is an AIA registered course. Please get your information into us and we'll make sure you get accreditation and also IDCEC approved. Um, getting us that information will get your accreditation for this also. So let's begin. So today we're going to be talking about tiling exterior, exterior tile installations. And we've got a few learning objectives that we're going to touch on as we go through this, pre through this presentation. We want to understand the dynamics of exterior installation and how to plan for success. The big thing is with an exterior application, um, there's a lot of other things to be thinking about. It's not like tiling uh, a little bathroom floor or, your, or an entryway in your home. There's a lot more involved when you go into tiling outside. And these are things that we're going to bring up and touch on as we go through this. We want you to know how to specify with industry stands, standards that are relevant to exterior installations. And there's a couple of changes that we're going to be talking about on exterior installations uh, that will affect veneer, veneer installations. And we'll touch on that later on in the presentation. We want to recognize critical additional details, such as flashing, waterproofing. And then also the, the selection of the tile or stone that you're going to be using, making sure you're getting the right product that's meant to be used on an exterior application and touching a little bit on sealers and finishing. Finally, we're going to learn proper selection of stone or gauge porcelain tile panels or slabs, porcelain tiles for the uh, in exterior and understand the effect of environmental conditions. So there's a lot of things that we're going to be touching base on and helping you get a better understanding of how to go about tiling an outside um, application and out, an outside installation or tiling the great outdoors. So why is there the growth in these exterior tile installations? What are we seeing that's making uh, more and more use of tile on, the, on exterior applications? Some of the things that we're seeing in the industry is the growth of gauge porcelain tile panels or slabs. Uh, I started in the tile installation uh, industry and the tile installation years ago, a large tile was an eight by eight tile, 12 by 12 tile. And now what we're starting to see is uh, a lot of you have worked with them panels, as large as five foot by 10 foot. And we're installing this both interior and exterior. Um, it, it gives a good contemporary look. And this is what designers are, are after. They're looking for something that has a a different look to it, a modern look to it, a clean look to it, a way of getting a permanent uh, finish onto a building and going into a larger and larger piece of tile. Some of the other things that we're seeing is that the substrates that we're working with are different than, than what they were years ago. Uh, the uh, better mortars and techniques can provide for a solid base for the tile installation. So all of these changes are making the use of an exterior tile installation um, that much more prevalent. So when we tell, take a look at exterior applications, it's one of the most challenging of installations. There's a lot to be considered, there's a lot to be thinking about before we just jump in and start tiling outside. Uh, 
guy that you hire to do your little entryway not, is not necessarily the guy that you want doing an exterior veneer for you. So be thinking about this. And these are some of the points that we're gonna to go over today, things to be thinking about when you're choosing someone for making a recommendation or an installation specification for the exterior applications. So some of the topics that we'll be touching on are environmental conditions. The importance of understanding what's going on in the environments and in the environment and how that's going to affect the overall installation uh, and how that installation is going to function. The right tile and stone selection. Uh, just because a, a stone comes from a mountain, does that necessarily mean it can be used outside? Things to be thinking about as we're making these selections. The substrates and the surface preparation, making sure that once we install this tile or stone, that it's going to stay in place, that it's going to function the way that we want it to, that we're not going to have a failure with. We're going to touch upon waterproofing, very critical part of an exterior application. Water management is, is critical, and it's beyond just waterproofing. What are we doing about waterproofing and water that's going to be affecting our finished application? And then we want to look at selecting uh, the setting mortars and the right setting mortars and the differences between some of the mortars. The mortar that you're using on an interior application is not necessarily the mortar you're going to be using exterior. And why we look at these different types of mortars and understanding some of the, the questions that you should have in selecting the right mortar. Talk about grout, um, very critical part of the finished installation, and some of the problems then with grouts, efflorescence, uh, some latex leaching, and then finally we'll touch a little bit on sealant. A lot to be covered today. And as we come across any of these topics, if there's questions, please type them in. And uh, if it's relevant at the moment, we'll answer them right there or we'll answer them at the end. So when we're looking at tiling outside, it starts the environmental conditions. It starts with the weather, it ends with the weather. We need to know what's going on in the climates that we're working at, both in the end after the installation is done, but also as we're working on the project, is it gonna be a sunny day, a cloudy day? We're fighting with rain or wind, or is a snowstorm coming in? We also wanna take a look at where we're doing the installations. Um, if we're working in a warm uh, area or something that's quite hot, and how we're gonna affect the, how that's gonna affect the overall application, what we're going to do to protect our work, so that we can work in an exterior application under these various conditions. Things to be thinking about uh, with hot weather. Similarly, with cold weather, uh, there is just because it gets down to being a really cold condition doesn't necessarily mean that work stops. It's how are we gonna handle this, work with this, so that work can continue on and we can get our applications done in various conditions. So when we look at job site practices and the best practices, recommended temperature should be a minimum of 45 degrees Fahrenheit and 95 degrees. Now what this means is that, um, is that not only the air temperature, but the ambient temperature of the surface uh, conditions that you're working on. So let's say, for example, we're doing a project in Arizona and it's gonna be in the summertime and we know that the, the air temperature is gonna be hitting up to 110 degrees that means the surface temperature of the substrate that we're going on could be a lot higher, 150, 160, maybe all the way up to 180 degrees, depending upon how it's facing in the sun. So just because we get a couple of cool days, does that mean that the ambient temperature of the surface we're working on has cooled down? Probably not. So if we're working in these hotter conditions, what we need to do is cover that and, and protect it to shade it to bring down the temperature of the surface condition that we're going to be working with, making sure that our mortars are going to react in the proper way. Similarly, if we're working in a cold climate and it's um, and it's been freezing for a number of days and all of a sudden we get a warm spell, does that mean that we're ready to install a tile? The ambient temperature of the, the, the substrate may still be down close to that freezing mark. So unless we warm that up, brought it up to the right temperature, we could have a problem in the installation of these products. And what ends up happening that curing and protection times may vary depending upon temperature and materials. It can have an overall effect 
on what's happening with this installation and how the installation is going to react. So when we look at various job site conditions, that if on the exterior of a building in a hot area, covering that and bringing in evaporative cooling or, or fans, bringing down temperature, or in a, a freezing condition, they'll, they'll wrap a building and put space heaters in there to bringing the temperature of the building up so that the exterior tile application can be done under the right working conditions. And in projects where it's freezing outside and inside that tented in area, you can be working in your shirt sleeves and being quite comfortable. So these are things that we have to take into consideration when we're looking at doing it in an exterior application. Also the need for protecting from direct sunlight, rain or wind. Uh, if we know that we're gonna have a rainy day uh, coming up and we're doing a bunch of, we're doing a tile installation, how are we protecting that so that we don't end up having the rain affect our installation before our mortars are cured? or wind blowing on it to setting off the mortar before we get a tile embedded into it. See, so all things that we have to take into consideration and plan on in advance before we start installing the tile, all things to take into consideration. When we take a look at selecting tile or stone, our current codes, and this is something that we get involved with on veneer and I get questioned all the time, what size tile can we put on in a direct bond application? Currently, the code is adhered units shall not exceed 5 eighths of an inch in thickness, 24 inches in any facial uh, dimension, or more than three square feet in total face area, and shall not weigh more than nine pounds per square foot. And of course, a porcelain tile adhered to improve backing. We've got conditions exceeding that, we get into mechanical anchoring, where now we're attaching the the tile or stone with the mechanical method, wire clips, uh, various types of uh, installation things uh, for actual mechanical anchoring. What we're starting to see is that in the, the demand for larger units uh, being used outside, what can be done for a direct bond? There have been some changes in the code that are being announced that have been accepted that will be published in 2021, but are starting to come into play. Um, and again, what we're seeing now is that an adhered unit uh, weighing more than 3.5 pounds per square foot shall not exceed 48 inches in any facial dimension or more than nine square uh, total feet. However, adhered units weighing less than 3.5 pounds per square foot shall not exceed 72 inches in any facial di uh, dimension or exceed seven and a half square feet. What we're looking at uh, folks, is that these large panels that we're seeing produced, we can now go with a panel four foot by four foot direct bond as long as it's a thin material. It's a great um, step forward in when we're looking at adhering systems directly to a, a veneer. On exterior, and some of the other things that we have to take into consideration when we're hanging a veneer on an exterior application is your clearances at your ground level. On exterior stud walls, not less than four inches above the earth. In other words, we want, we want to have that tile sitting up at least four inches above raw earth. Uh, if it's over a paved area, we're looking at uh, no less than two inches. And if the uh, wall and substrate um, bond together, we're looking at a minimum of a half an inch of clearance of the tile coming off that substrate. This is to allow for proper drainage of moisture getting in behind the tile, weeping down the walls in a way of affecting getting out of the system. Another thing that we take a look at as we go into the proper tile or stone selection is not only the code compliance of how we're going to install it, looking at the color. Um, I will happen to be on a project a couple of years ago going to a project in Arizona and summer day actually was in the summer was already into September, which is still quite hot. And as we approached this building, they had used a darker granite on the exterior of this building. And as you walked up closer to it, it felt like you were stepping into an oven. Temperature that day was probably about 100 degrees outside in the sun. This, the temperature coming off that building had to have been close to 140, 150 degrees. So the, the use of a dark tile in that condition is probably not the smartest thing that could have been done. 
we talked about the size of the tile and the limitations, not only the facial dimensions, but the overall weight, if we're going to be doing a direct bond or mechanical anchoring, Make, being aware of the weight. And then if we're, walk, if we're putting an exterior tile for um, a wear surface, a walking surface, making sure that we're complying with slip uh, resistant uh, with that tile so we don't have a slip fall situation. Things to be thinking about when choosing the tile or the stone, proper tile selection, a water absorption, density, um, the resistance uh, uh, that the tile will have to staining, to colorate, to uh, uh, things affecting it, abrasion, thermal shock, all of these different things in selecting that tile. And so what I say is as you look at selecting that tile or stone, sit down with that supplier and ask them, is this this, this tile rated for an exterior application. Can I use this in a freeze thaw cycle? We're gonna be looking at a hard freeze. Will this tile or this stone hold up in those conditions? Have you tested it for it? How will it affect under, the, under various adverse conditions? Making sure that the supplier of that stone is not just giving you the perfect color that you, your client wants, but rather that that tile or stone will actually work in those types of applications and, and be effective for the overall installation. When we're looking at stone, making sure that the stone has been tested with ASTM testing, uh, to making sure that the right absorption, density, stain resistance for an exterior application or interior, making sure that the, there's the right compressive strength of the stone and, the, and its resistance uh, to loads, um, making sure that what type of material can be used for bonding the stone uh, so that we don't end up with a problem of it cracking um, or uh, laminating. Uh, what hold up to scratching and abrasion resistance. Again, asking these questions as to what type of testing was done so that you're selecting the right product that your client is getting what they expect out of this application item, final installation. Proper stone selection is important. As I said earlier, just because the stone came from a mountain does not necessarily mean it can be used outside. It has a higher absorption rate and in a freeze thaw area that moisture inside the stone expands when it freezes and starts popping or delaminating the stone. So in a lot of cases, certain stones, limestones, travertines, other types can absorb a moisture, freeze and end up spalling or coming apart as this picture still indicates. Um, in some cases, a higher absorption on the stone can show that the stone will, will have staining or shading or dark colors fading, the spalling effect because of an improper uh, selection of the stone on this type of an application. We start looking at the walls and, the, and your substrate and surface preparation. Um, what are we doing with the walls? What kind of system are we going in with? Is it going to be a concrete block, a masonry, or a cement board? We're going to be putting up mortar. How are we putting this together to making sure that the substrate and the surface is ready for the tile or stone installation, and we're going over the right um, total installation to giving a proper finished project uh, that will last up to the life expectancy that, that uh, the client is expecting. Making sure on walls, on various considerations that it's flat plumb on the surface preparation. As we get into larger and larger formats, I'm sure you've all heard that the flatness of a floor, instead of being a quarter of an inch and 10 feet is an eighth of an inch and 10 feet. Similarly, if we're doing wall applications on the large format tile, we come into the same flatness or plumb. We need to be an eighth of an inch and 10 feet so that we have a a smooth, flat looking finish when the job is completely installed. And how are we taking care of this and putting up a mortar bed or rendering coats and making sure that the wall is flat enough for these large format uh, tile? Looking at flashing and details around windows and openings, making sure that we don't end up with leaking inside the building and that the detail is properly uh, uh, followed so that there isn't a problem uh, with installation or leaking in at a later time. When we look at the decks and the surface preparation on the floors, 
Uh, again, what systems are we going over? And one of the things with decking, is, uh, the first thing is uh, if we're over occupied living space, what is going to be our primary waterproofing? What are we putting together to making sure that this, the um, system is waterproof? And then how do we build up our tile system on top of that? Um, many uh, installations in, in the past, what we've always had to ask is, what's your primary waterproofing? To making sure that the mortar beds in the, that we're going to use or the bond coats that we're going to use are going to be compatible with the mortar beds. Now what we're looking at is look for a company that can supply both the primary waterproofing, the drainage mats, uh, the mortar beds, the bond coats, and all the way up through a complete total installation so that it's one system uh, being supported by one company and a complete um, warranty system for this total installation. But looking at the compatibility of all of these products to making sure that you've got an installation system that's gonna work going to perform and give the life expectancy that the client is expecting. When we take a look at going over um, uh, deck considerations, the first thing is, how is it sloped to drain? I worked on a project a number of years ago in Hawaii uh, where we were called in to remedy a problem and the decks on this particular building, the way that they had put together whenever it rained, water would run back into the guest rooms of this hotel because of the way the decks were sloped. So the first thing was, how do we change this to get the sloping away from the building and then the proper waterproofing uh, with that proper flashing details um, and if, if needed, drainage mats uh, to making sure that um, moisture is getting away from the building um, and addressing the, those type of issues. Exterior application, we touched a little bit on water. Water management is critical. It's beyond just the waterproof. What are we doing with our with the water to making sure that uh, we're effectively moving it away from our building? Uh, this is a great picture of the Grand Canyon. And remember, uh, it started out as a, just a little river and uh, over the eons, water carbon that, um, that uh, the great spectacle of the Grand Canyon. Um, Likewise, water can be very damaging to a building uh, if we're not controlling it, deflecting it away from the building and moving it away so it doesn't have an, uh, an impact on our building. So when we take a look at waterproofing and, and doing an exterior application, some of the things that we have to remember on that, on the proper waterproofing is following the four Ds. How can you stop water from getting in? First thing is deflecting the water shed water by a proper water management system, including deflecting devices, eaves, overhangs, weathering deflectors. In other words, moving the water away from uh, our finished tile project. Uh, how are we getting that water so it's not laying on, on the surface? It's uh, moving away from our building, moving away from where our finished product is gonna be. Drainage, um, rooftops, gutters, uh, flashing, drains. Um, the other thing that we're looking at is around the perimeter of the building is a French drain so that the water is being pulled away from the building so that we're making sure that water is not getting into this finished project. Right, drying, providing the right ventilation, making sure that entrapped water has a means to evaporate or coming out of, this, out of the structure. And then finally, making sure that the products are suitable for the installation, that they're durable, including the waterproofing that will performed through the life cycle of the installation. Looking at that these products are designed to being used outside, that they will hold up under freeze thaw conditions and under the uh, severe conditions of, say something up in Canada or in Alaska, uh, where we have hard freeze thaw, that over the life cycle of the building, that this waterproofing isn't gonna be breaking down, making sure that the waterproofing is designed to meet those types of conditions. So all of these things become an important part questioning before you start putting this specification together. Make sure that all of the products are compatible, that they are going to work in the proper manner. Now, we've taken a look at how we've selected a tile, we've selected the conditions that we're working under. We, we know that we um, working conditions, we know what the building is going to um, 
uh, go through in its life cycle. Uh, we talked about the waterproofing. Now we start talking about the bond coats for the, uh, the tile or the stone, the mortar beds that we're going to be using to bond the tile to the structure. And um, also, also often we I'll run into a specification that the architect will put together and he'll say using a polymer modified mortar line with ANSI 118.4. And as we know, ANSI 118.4 uh, has the polymers in the, in the mortar to making them a stickier order to help support us tile or stone. This specification just doesn't cut it in that exterior application. Um, setting material companies have mortars uh, as many as 30, 40 mortars that will comply with ANSI 118.4. So what we have to take a look at is what do we expect to happen with this building so that as we choose the mortar that we're going to use to adhere the Tyler stone, it's going to function properly. And what we take a look at is when you look at a non-modified mortar or a mortar that complies with ANSI 118.1, basically it's a stand in the cement. So there's some other uh, retardants in there that help hold moisture to it. A very simple mortar on your tile to a substrate but when when it it's exposed to a lot of movement from heat or cold expansion and movement it'll break down it'll it'll come apart uh, it has very little expansion when we look at your dry polymer modified mortars these are mortars they take um, a, a, a polymer that's been dried out added into a bag of your sand and cement and then at the job site, they'll add water to it. And again, making a polymer modified mortar, it uh, complies with ANSI 118.4. The biggest thing is the amount of movement that you're getting out of that type of a mortar. It's a very minimal movement. Will it hold your tile or stone to the substrate? Sure. How long will it hold there? It depends upon movement and um, climate change, how your building is being affected by expansion and contraction from heat and cold. Um, not the best mortar that you be using on that type of an application. Then we get into uh, your mortars that are, are mixed with uh, liquid um, acrylics or liquid polymers. Um, a regular acrylic, uh, we're starting to see movement um, and, um, up to three millimeters of movement. And we get into your advanced flexible acrylics, seven tenths to eight tenths of a millimeter of movement. So what this is saying is that our mortars, by using these two-part polymer modified mortars with a very flexible acrylic, the mortar has more capability of moving than the substrate or the tile or stone that you're bonding to. So it becomes kind of like the elastic in your sock. If you keep stretching on the elastic in your sock, if it isn't a good sock, the elastic breaks down and your socks don't stay up. A good elastic socks last. Same type of thing. These good polymer modified mortars for an exterior application will last the lifetime of the building, the life cycle of the building that you're expecting out of it. They will hold together. So as you get into specifying an exterior application, whether it's on a deck or on a veneer, um, making sure that you're not just calling out a simple mortar, but you're selecting the mortar that will perform and have the um, the movement that you expect out of it, that has the flexibility that you expect out of it, that will allow the building to last and perform the way your owner, your client is expecting it to do. When we get into exterior applications, um, the practices of how to install the, the, um, the mortars to making sure that we're getting the right coverages. Back buttering is in, you know, for exterior applications is mandatory. On an exterior application, we're trying to achieve a 95% coverage of the mortar to the, to the substrate. So if you take down a tile, if you're seeing ridge marks, you're not getting that 95% coverage. What we're trying to do by getting this coverage is, as you're seeing in this picture, the installer is, is taking the mortar, flat side of his trowel, he's combing it across the back of the uh, tile, achieving a, a cover, full coverage onto the back of the tile, He'll then comb the wall, placing the two, the tile and the, uh, in, onto the substrate and achieving this, um, trying to achieve to this 95% coverage. We'd like to 100%, um, but there's always a void somewhere. But 95% is what we're going for. And that's 
industry standards for an exterior application. Occasionally, as the tile is going up, pull down a piece of tile, look, and making sure that the coverage is there. Check on the material for dust or debris or any contamination that will prevent a good bond of the tile on, on coming into contact with the mortar. Remember, any dust blowing in the air, any debris acts as a bond breaker. Simple, just like if, as you're rolling out cookie dough, if you put flour on the counter, the dough doesn't stick to the counter. If you're putting up mortar and dust is flying through the air, that dust is now acting as a bond breaker. So this is important of making sure your, your work area is protected so we don't have dust attacking the mortar until the tile is set into it properly and set into it. Ensure that there's positive contact, removing air pockets. Um, the other uh, uh, critical part of this is troweling in one direction so that as you're putting the ridges of the um, trowel marks from the tile, uh, back buttering onto the tile, onto the substrate, they're locking it together, becoming like a big zipper. We're showing here a thin set best practices. Respect the mix ratios and mixing speeds. We have a lot of chemists that spent a lot of time designing these products over the years and know how much water or acrylic needs to go into a product to make it function properly, to work properly. We start seeing a mortar starting to set up. Um, don't be going and adding more liquid to it and remixing it. Uh, it's best throw it away, start fresh, start remixing again. Uh, the cost of a bag of mortar is very inexpensive compared to the cost of redoing a building because tile failed and it's falling off. Allow time for slaking remixing following the instructions that are put out onto the manufacturer's recommendations on the proper way of mixing these mortars. It's important that the mortars have the right amount of time to bind that the chemical reaction that's going on inside these mortars is taking place so that as you place the tile or the stone into the mortar onto the substrate, it's locking together and it's forming a, a, a complete bond uh, so that the tile will stay there uh, when we won't have a failure. Use the recommended trowel to achieve 95% transfer. Take a note of that picture of the gentleman installing the mortar right there. You notice how he's combing the mortar in one direction keeping all of the lines going the same way. That piece of tile or stone that he's gonna pick up and, and back butter, put the ridges going the same direction. So as he places that together, puts it into the mortar, he'll slide it up and down perpendicular to those ridges, achieving that full coverage, that 95% transfer to making sure that that tile or stone is properly locked into place and no problems with it. Um, so now that we've got the product installed, we're, we're covering our work, we're protecting our work, and now what we're looking at is we're going to finish this off um, for the type of grouts that we're going to be using uh, for an exterior application. And typically what we're seeing is a standard cement, um, Portland cement uh, grout, or we're going to talk about a high performance cement grouts, two different types of grouts that we typically will use for an exterior application. When we're looking at cement-based grouts, these comply with your ANSI 118.6, a standard cement, and then your high-performance uh, uh, cement grouts is ANSI 118.7. The installation method follows ANSI 108.10, and then um, ISO standards on this is uh, cement grouts, ISO 13007 cement grouts. We're gonna look at some differences between the grouts. Your typical Portland cement grout um, Portland cement, uh, various additives into it to hold in our uh, retention of water so it, can, it cures the pigments in it for the coloring. And one of the problems with a traditional Portland cement is, is that moisture getting into that, a lot of times we can end up with that fluorescence of salts into the grout, the discoloration of the grout, uh, too much water into it, uh, washes out color as they're putting it up. Uh, a hot day, the installer will overwash, overmix, and having problems with it. When we take a look at your high performance grouts, your ANSI 118.7 high performance cement grouts, typically they're a non-Portland cement grouts. They use a calcium aluminate cements, which are a rapid setting cement. Uh, these are ideal for exterior application. They use less water in mixing, 
Thus, they also give off less water of uh, convenience or less water is coming out of the ground. So what we see is a more color consistent drought. Uh, the drought is uh, when you mix it up as a mocha color and you wash it, it stays mocha. It doesn't become latte because the color gets washed out. Um, these droughts have little to no uh, susceptibility of efflorescence. Um, there is the free lime that is produced in the curing process of, of, um, of Portland cement isn't coming to the surface, bringing those salts to the surface and leaving that white salty residue known as the efflorescence. So if we were looking at a project to try to avoid any of the problems with um, efflorescence, going to these types of grouts, they also have a lower uh, porosity, typically less than 5%, which is a great advantage over traditional Portland cement, and which will give you a better color consistency and resistance to staining. Often we're asked, should these grouts be sealed? They still are cement grout. Uh, recommend sealing these types of grouts to prevent penetration of oil stains, especially on patios, food areas, where you might be spilling uh, uh, greases from barbecues or the or red wine, uh, preventing this uh, staining of the crowd. One of the uh, some of the other advantages of these high performance cement grouts is that there's less shrinkage and, and water absorbed. Um, they can be submerged in uh, water in 72 hours, so a lot faster curing time on them. Higher compressive tensile strength and flexural strength. A universal uh, formula typically joins from 16th of an inch to three quarters of an inch. So we're using a fine aggregate um, in these grouts and uh, instead of needing an unsanded grout for a tight joint as you would with a traditional 118.6 grout, we can use one grout that'll go anywhere from a 16th of an inch all the way up to three quarters of an inch in a joint and not have cracking, shrinking, or um, uh, problems that uh, a typical Portland cement uh, uh, grout would give. Again, caution should be taken if you're installing with glass or some stone to do an, an area first to making sure that this uh, cement, this type of grout won't have an, a negative effect on the glass or on the stone, making sure that uh, test area is first done. So some of the challenges when we start looking at um, doing exterior work. Uh, so we see a, a tile delamination, in other words, tile coming off the building. What's happened here? Uh, properly, uh, did we have an improper selection of mortar? Did we just use a basic ANSI 118.4 mortar, put this tile up onto the wall, and now all of a sudden we have a freeze thaw condition, and the tile starts popping off the wall? Was it properly installed, making sure that we had full coverage or the 95% um, uh, coverage that the industry uh, requires, or did they go into, and we'll show some pictures in a moment, what's called spot bonding, something that should never be done. So this lack of coverage, or perhaps lack of movement joints, and we're going to be talking about that also. Some of the other ex exterior challenges are efflorescence and latex leaching. We're going to be touching on those as we proceed further, further along into this. So what we're looking at here is a tile delamination. These pictures show what was done on this installation of a spot bonding. In other words, the installer took uh, globs of mortar, placed it onto the wall, onto, onto the tile, and just pushed it into the wall, getting a nice flat wall look great on the finished application, um, nice and smooth. Uh, but as the project went through heat and cold cycles, tile started popping off because there wasn't adequate um, coverage out of the back of this uh, stone. I've got a personal experience a number of years ago was involved with a project in Salt Lake City a hotel and they had used a granite on the on the veneer of this building and as the uh, building went up uh, got it all finished the rains came and, um, and we were getting called that the stone was turning dark what's the matter with this stone and after a few days of no rain, stone going back to its normal color, and there must be something wrong with the mortar. There was all kinds of different uh, questions as to what was going on, why we were having a problem. After another rain, we asked permission to drill a hole into the stone, and lo and behold, water came shooting out of the hole. As we did further investigation, we found that the 
splashing wasn't done properly. And then during the rains, water was getting in. And when we started removing tile, the stone, we found that spot bonding was being, had been used for the installation system. So what was happening is during the rain, the wall cavity was filling up with this water, causing the stone to look dark. And then after the rains went away and it would start evaporating out, it went back to its bright color. Needless to say, the whole job came down to properly install it. So spot bonding is not a method to be used and staying away from it. Exterior tiles should have, if you remember one thing today, remember this 95% coverage. It's a very critical uh, part of the application. Also, when you get into the spot bonding, you'll end up with a poor impact resistance. Uh, if you're around an area where traffic might be up against it or, or uh, uh, a lot of people are coming across it, you have a poor load resistance. And then of course, with the moisture issues that we just mentioned. There's an actual um, um, series on a bad tile installation that was done in San Jose where a spot bonding method was in, uh, involved and what happened to this tile and the amount of tile that was falling off the, off the building, just peeling away because of this type of an application. Spot bonding is never to be used. Uh, you're setting yourself up for a major failure, major lawsuit uh, if you're allowing this type of application to be, to, uh, to be done. So remember, 95% is the coverage you're expecting on an exterior application, both uh, vertical and horizontal application. Um, again, some of the challenges, and we touched on this a little bit, is the lack of coverage. Make sure the, the mortar is properly covered that we're getting it over. The skimming of the mortar, protecting an area from wind, from draft, uh, from um, the elements affecting it so that the mortar doesn't start to have a skin on it because that the tile or stone will not properly bond into it. Uh, we currently are working on a project in uh, Nebraska where the installer was going to be working on an exterior walkway of stone. And his concerns were, you know, um, this job was supposed to start in the summer and the, the heat that might be involved, how am I going to prevent this from skimming over and, and um, giving him the idea of covering this a couple of days in advance, bringing down the temperature and leaving these coverings and these awnings up as he's doing the application, prevents sunlight from beating right down onto his mortar, protecting it from wind, protecting the mortar from skimming over so that he could get a proper installation, a proper bond with, uh, with this, the tile in this particular case, of course, the paper that he installed. Uh, this project is almost uh, complete, it started late, and uh, it's turned out great um, because of the, these little practices that he followed in making sure that this um, was properly installed. Making sure that substrates are properly cured in, that you're spreading the mortar in one direction, uh, trawling it in, keying it in with the backside of the, uh, the trowel, and then spreading your proper amount of uh, mortar with the, the notch trowel. Trawling in one direction, maybe to covering it, maybe going in a couple of directions, but then your final pass, it's all in one direction so that the mortar is directional so that you're locking together your tile and your mortar on the substrate. And then always remember implementing that greater than 95% coverage, critical parts. The other problem that we run into is movement joints. I get questions on this all the time on the proper application of movement joints for exterior applications. They are critical. Designers don't like them. Uh, they're afraid that it's breaking up the overall look of a project, but movement joints must be done on every eight to 12 feet in both directions on an exterior application. This is to allow for the proper movement that we know that's gonna take place in a tile or a stone, expansion and contraction, so it doesn't fail. Make sure that interior corners, exterior corners, um, are, are caulked with proper uh, siliconized caulk for these joints. Um, on, a, on the corners, uh, one wall might be facing due south where the other wall is, is facing east. And so the difference is in temperature on that. And so those two walls are moving completely different from one another. It's important at that, that corners that we have movement joints so that we don't have a failure of the tile and the, the loss of bond. 
follow TCNA method EJ171, making sure that proper insulation joints are done. Allow for this thermal and moisture expansion and contraction. Often I'm questioned, do, does the joint have to be as large as the grout joint? Can we go into a larger or a smaller movement joint? Yes, there's formulations of figuring that, but you have to look at what the, the tile is gonna expand and contract, making sure that we have in adequate movement joints. And in the cases now getting into the larger panel tiles, we saw where we talked earlier, up to four foot by four foot panels that can be directly bonded. In that case, we, we're not using grout, we're going in with a siliconized caulk around the perimeter of that panel so that the whole panel has an expansion or movement joint around it, um, rather than grouting it in with a hard grout. Things to take into consideration as you're going into these larger panels. Here's the um, actual application of, of showing um, lack of movement joints, the tile buckling and coming off the substrate because of the fact that uh, movement joints weren't placed and as the tile uh, expanded because of heat uh, losing that entire floor. Other grout is some of the grouting challenges, the efflorescence, we touched on that, it's the white salts that are produced from the free line that uh, happens as uh, cements cure. That free line is brought to the surface uh, with moisture. As the moisture evaporates, the salts remain. Uh, this is common in cold weather, um, moisture coming out, coming out of the surface, salts onto the surface, moisture issues, uh, rain going into the grout, into the mortar beds, bringing the, the salts to the surface, the moisture evaporates, the salts it, um, uh, remain, and then the different types of cement, the high alkali cement, will leave this efflorescence. Also being sure that you're, if you're using a true mortar bed that you're not using a contaminated aggregate. I've been on jobs where they swore up and down, they got the right mortars on coats, but the aggregate that they used, the sand that they were using was not a clean sand. And after uh, thorough testing, they found that the efflorescence was um, based off the sand, not being a clean washed sand. So making sure these are all taken into consideration um, when you're doing an exterior application. Also, a major problem with on the grout is that it's a hot day, and instead of covering the, the work, uh, the installer says, well, the grout's starting to set up, let's use some more water. And they add more water to it, and what ends up happening is they wash it, not only wash out the color, leaving more water in it, and then leaving an efflorescence problem further on. The other problem that we look at on tile installations a lot of times it's confused uh, as an efflorescence when it's latex leaching. The latex leaching is that the moisture has gotten back into the mortar beds, it's pulling the latex to the surface. Moisture got into it, the, um, the substrate wasn't allowed to properly cure before getting wet. We've seen installations where the tile was put up and um, a heavy rain came before it was grouted. And instead of letting that dry out, letting the, all of the moisture back out of the system, uh, the installers went in grouted. And a couple of weeks later, all of a sudden you see latex coming out of the building because as the water, the moisture is coming out now of the mortar beds through the grout, it's bringing latex to the surface and causing this latex leaching. It can be cleaned up. It takes a lot more work to get off. The other problem that we run into on uh, where we see the latex leaching is um, bad detailing on, on um, flashing. As a tile installer, as an architect, as a contractor, when we get together and start looking at doing a veneer, having all the trades that are gonna be involved looking at this, who's doing the flashing? Is it the sheet metal guy? Is it the roofing guy? To making sure that once the tile goes up, the flashing is coming in immediately, protecting that work. So in case it does rain, moisture is not getting in behind the work and causing for this latex leaching. Uh, it's difficult, to, like I say, it's difficult to clean. It can be cleaned off. Uh, let's try to avoid it by taking the proper steps um, beforehand, before we run into a problem. Again, this is showing a, a failure of um, flashing, uh, improper flashing, moisture getting in behind that, causing problems uh, down the road, the installation. We're going to take a little bit, again, some more time on movement joints, uh, following current standards, use 
um, uh, requirements from TCNA EJ171. Um, EJ171 in the 2017 uh, was improved in showing on guidance on size and frequency. Exterior movement joints, I'll touch on this again, must be spaced between eight to 12 feet apart in both directions. So addressing this, and remember, as the architect, it's your responsibility to lay out these movement joints to making sure that they're being placed in the proper um, application so that we don't have a problem and that the proper uh, material is being used uh, for the um, movement joints, backer rods being put into place, the proper siliconized caulking uh, that's going to move in conjunction with um, uh, this system. So taking a look at kind of a summarizing and going over a few of the things. Know that exteriors are not the, the same as an interior application, an interior project. Uh, the person that you hired to put down a little bit of tile in your entryway um, is facing a lot of different conditions and what you're looking at and facing on an exterior application. Uh, the trend is that we're doing, we're, we're creating a lot more living space outside, decks, patios. We want that finished uh, application on our building, so tile veneers. So the, the means that we're using to put these tile and stones up have changed. Types of applications and the substrates that we're going over are different. And so that we need to stay on top of how these, um, applications are being done. Select a tile contractor that has gone through the right training that he's up uh, to speed on the methods that are being used for these exterior applications. Just like you as an architect uh, take so many learning uh, sessions a year, AIA classes, keeping your license intact. Tile installers um, are uh, taking various classes at times and asking them if they've gone through the right training to understand the implications of tiling on an exterior application, whether it's a veneer, a deck, or a floor, and the conditions that are involved in dealing with that to making sure that that application is gonna work. Know that you're gonna be dealing with water. How are we dealing with the drainage? How are we getting the water away from the building? How are we preventing it from building up around the building? How are we deflecting it? Making sure that we're addressing all of the issues of water and making sure that we're we're using the right waterproofings, making sure that the waterproofing that we're gonna be using, one, if we're doing a deck, is it starting out as a primary waterproofing to be used over a living space? And then in what we're doing as a secondary waterproofing with the tile or stone installation, making sure that these waterproofings are suitable for those type of applications so that we don't have a failure later on. That the waterproofing will stand up to a hard freeze thaw or a, a, the heat from uh, uh, our desert areas, um, making sure that you've checked those products out, that they are suitable for those type of applications. Protect from the weather. We can install in freezing climates by uh, exterior if the building is wrapped and properly enclosed so that we can work in that condition and keeping the ambient temperature up. Uh, if it's extremely hot, how are we keeping that uh, substrate cool so that the Orders will properly set up and locking the tile or stone into place so that we don't have a failure. Covering from wind and sun directly blowing on onto the substrate to drying out mortar before tile is installed to it, making sure that it's properly done. And then, again, this gets into the controlling of the temperature of the weather of the job site conditions. And just because the outside temperature has dropped for a couple of days does not necessarily mean that the substrate temperature is has dropped in the same amount, making sure that you've cooled down the substrate or warmed up the substrate in a freestyle condition so that your mortars will properly bond and adhere and hold the tile or stone properly into, into place. And water management is essential, making sure that flashings, you're talking to the people that are working with it, whether it's the sheet metal worker or the roofing uh, contractor, to making sure flashings are put in place to deflecting water away from um, openings and um, moving water in the right direction away from the finished project. Mortar coverage, and I hope all of you have walked away today with that number 95 uh, firmly embedded in your mind that you're looking at 95% coverage. And you as an architect or project manager, when you're on the job, ask the installer, hold down a piece of that tile, let me see the coverage. 
And if you're seeing trawl marks, you know he has nowhere near 95% coverage and tell him to keep taking it down until you see the proper coverage. It's your project. Make him follow the industry standards, making sure that we have an installation that will work, a tile won't be falling off and causing for other problems. Use a quality mortar recommended for exteriors. Talk to your supplier of your mortars. Just because it complies with ANSI 118.4 or 118.15, is that mortar designed to be used in these type of conditions? What's its expansion? What will happen over a, a series of free saw cycles? Will the mortar perform like we expect it to perform? Find out these, these questions and then select your mortar based off of those criteria in putting that installation together. Make sure your movement joints are frequent and properly installed. You as the architect, as I mentioned, have the responsibility of laying out the movement joints, where they're going to be placed, working with your installer so that they're properly done and so that we don't have a failure based on movement joints. And making sure that everything is well cured before exposing it to the environment. Looking at the curing times of products, rapid setting materials, do set up a lot quicker and there are advantages. To it. If they can be exposed to the water and to the elements, making sure it is properly government, covered for the right amount of time so there isn't a failure due to curing. So as we take, take a look at the conclusion today, there's three takeaways I want you to go away from. With remembering exterior applications require additional planning before you start sticking the tile up, what is going on with that planning? Making sure all the steps are taken into place, so that the planning is done before we start installing. We need to provide a complete installation solution from the, the substrate, the flatness, the mortar beds, the bond coats, the waterproofings to the grout. It's a complete package, a complete system. It's an installation solution. And then look to a single source for your installation needs. Get everything from a single source. Don't let the contractor piecemeal something together because if it fails, everybody just stands around pointing fingers and nothing gets resolved. With that, I open it up to questions and answers. And if you want additional information, here's where I can be reached. Jen, any questions coming in from the audience? There are some, Mike. Thank you. Um, the first one is, uh, what about exterior but covered installation? Is the joint still needed every 12 inches? Every 12, uh, 8 to 12 feet. Yes. Excuse me, it's feet. I'm sorry. I'm looking at yes. it. Yes. Okay. It is still every okay, 8 to 12 feet because, because even though it may be covered, it's be still being exposed to the elements as to the freeze thaw or the buildup of temperature. So you still have that type of movement going on. So that's yes. Yes. Okay, good. Sorry, that's 12 feet. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> all right, the next one. They're asking about epoxy grouts. Um, they've heard that epoxy grouts are the best grouts. Can it be used for exterior application? Absolutely, an epoxy grout can be used for an exterior application. There's a couple of things to keep in mind when you're using an epoxy. An epoxy is a plastic, so the lighter color epoxies will tend to yellow over a period of time. And I've been um, involved with a project, um, oh, a number of years back, it was on a, on a decking around a pool area. They used an epoxy, and they had big planters set in different areas. And it was about two years later, they started moving the planters around and I got a call saying, what's the matter with your epoxy? It's this bright color here and how come it looks yellow over here? And it was because of UV on the, epo on, on the light colored epoxy. It, it, caused, it to, uh, caused it to look um, yellow. So that is one of the things to be aware of. But yes, an epoxy can be used outside. Be aware of, of the lighter colors, um, the effects of UV on it. Aha, uh -huh. good. Another question, how large of a panel can be installed outside? Right now, the industry standards are accepting a four foot by four foot direct bond. Um, we've worked on projects um, in various areas where larger panels have gone up. The first project that we worked on was a, a car dealership in Kansas City where it was a four foot by 10 foot panel. The city of Kansas, Kansas City itself, the building department, approved the installation, but they wanted it installed 
and epoxy. Um, this job has been up now, I think, eight or nine years, performing extremely well. Uh, I've worked on other projects where we've used the five foot by 10 foot panels going up 13 floors in the city of Los Angeles. The city required that at every 10 foot, they had an angle iron, um, a stainless steel angle iron was attached to the building. The panel was directly bonded to the substrate, but the weight is transferred back to the building with this angle iron. So if you're getting away from this four foot by four foot, the city planners, the city building code is going to tell you how it can be done. So we are seeing larger panel, panels being done, but right now uh, the standards coming out is basically a four foot by four foot based based on the, the thickness as, as a direct bond. Uh, we have time for one more question. Can urethane grouts be used on the exterior? Uh, yes, urethane grouts can be used on exterior. Uh, check with the manufacturer as to a urethane grout is, uh, is also similar to what is used for, um, uh, urethanes are used for expansion joint material. So the urethane grouts can. Check with the manufacturer if they're looking at these pre-mixed grouts, can they be exposed to um, water on a continual basis to making sure that they're designed to be used in that application. Um, some of them uh, submerged in water can't be used. Check with the manufacturer on that. Okay. And although we have to close up here, we will always accept more questions via email. Uh, at your email, mgranatowski at mapay.com, or you can reach out to mapay digital at mapay.com, and we will make sure that the questions get sent to the proper person. Also, please, if you have an AIA number, send it to us at mapay, mapaydigital.com, and uh, we will be happy to make sure that it gets to the right person. That's mapay digital at mapay.com. And uh, with that, I thank you for attending, and thank you, Mike. And All we'll right. see you next week. Awesome. Week Everybody stay that. safe. Sorry. Thank you. Bye bye.